Well, if we can cut the corpus callosum, maybe the bad activity from those neurons that's making this hemisphere go bad won't get over to this other hemisphere and make it go bad. That was the idea. So we're going to cut the corpus callosum so that only one hemisphere at a time goes down in epileptic seizure. So they, they did this surgery. I, I was friends with one of the surgeons who, who did this, Joe, Joe Bogan, um, a brilliant surgeon. Mm -hmm. and, and it was a success. So they cut the corpus callosum and the, the epileptic seizures disappeared or were, were much, much less, um, less harmful. But what they found was these people had interesting differences from the rest of us. So in one experiment, you have this, uh, a split brain patient looking at a computer screen, looking straight at, at the middle of the screen, and you just flash up a phrase like, the word, the phrase key ring. So key appears over there, ring appears over there. They're, they're looking right in the middle. So key appears to the left of where they're looking, ring appears to the right of where they're looking. Now, and it flashes up there for like a tenth of a second. So it's really fast. And if you ask a, a person, a normal person, what did you see? They'll say, I saw key ring, no problem. Very, very easy. With these patients, the split brain patients, they'll say, oh, I saw the word ring. You say, well, uh, you know, can, can you help me out here? What, what kind of ring? You know, doorbell ring, a wedding ring, a key ring? I don't know. I, I, I just saw the word ring. And you say, okay, well, um, I'm going to blindfold you. I'm going to give you a little box with all sorts of things. There's going to be little, you know, pencils and spoons and keys and rings and key ring. All sorts of stuff is in the box. I want you with your left hand while you're blindfolded to reach in, feel with your hand and, and pull out the thing that you just read. And so the person does that and their hand pulls out a key. And while they're still blindfolded, you ask them, um, okay, what's in your hand? And they'll say, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's in my left hand. And, and then you pull off the mask and, and you say, what, what's in, and have them look, and what's in your hand? They go, oh, there's a key. Well, you said that you saw the word ring. Why are you, why did you pull out a key? Uh, I don't know. And what you have is evidence that when you cut the corpus callosum, there was one hemisphere that saw the word key and could pull out a key with the left hand. It turns out the right hemisphere controls the left side of the body. The left hemisphere controls the right side of the body. And so the right hemisphere saw the word key. The left hemisphere saw the word ring. Nobody there is no consciousness that saw the phrase key ring. So here we have, and then the experiments get really interesting. You can ask questions to the right hemisphere and to the left hemisphere separately. And in, in one patient that uh, a friend of mine, V.S. Ramakandran, a, 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 a medical doctor in the San Diego area and a brilliant researcher at UC San Diego professor, um, in one, one patient that he studied, the left hemisphere believed in God and the right hemisphere was an atheist. So, so here we have within one skull, two separate consciousnesses with two separate personalities and actually two separate um, goals in life. There are some, there was one, one of these patients, the left hemisphere wanted to have a desk job as a draftsman. The right hemisphere wanted to be a race car driver. Completely different personalities in one head. So, so even, so each of us feels like I am one individual, one self, one entity, and I'm separate from, you know, the other people that I'm talking with, but even inside your own head, there's evidence that you're not just one, you're at least two. And those two different parts of you, those two different personalities could have e extremely different goals in life. They could have different conscious experiences. They could have different religious views. And, and so sometimes if you feel like there's maybe an internal conflict going on, it, it, it may be that there's in fact, you're, you're, you're experiencing that you're not just one, there are two different personalities that, that, are, that are negotiating with each other. So we have the experience of a single unified person that, you know, that's me, that's Don, or, or you know, that, that's Deepak, or that's Jennifer, where each of us most of the time feels like I'm a single unified person, but we now have this clean neuroscience evidence that in addition to being one, you're also two. And they can be <laughs> radically different. And yet somehow 
when the corpus callosum is there and the two separate personalities with their separate religious views interact in the right way, you get the illusion or perhaps the reality of a new unified coherent person as well. So that tells us, all that right there tells us that almost all the intuitions we bring to this question of what does it mean for me to be a, a self, an identity and separate from other selves, almost all of our intuitions are probably radically wrong and need to be uh, you know, addressed and, and corrected by you know, this neuroscience data. And, a, and actually we need a theory now of what, what is consciousness, what are selves, and how could it be that two separate selves, like as represented by my left and right hemisphere, could by their interaction create a new unified self? Is that really true or, or not? Is it an illusion that I'm a unified self or, or not? So at the top level, that's, you, know, you may want to probe further on this, but, but at top level, you, you can see how complicated this question is. Yeah, there, there's so many questions I have, and I'm sure Deepak does as well. So I'm going to go to you in a moment, Deepak. There were a couple of thoughts, Don. I think I remember it might have even been in one of your classes where there was another example of somebody with dissociative identity disorder where they shifted from one identity to another. And in one identity, they would have an allergy to orange juice. And in another identity, they would have no anaphylaxis. Am I remembering that correctly? There are many examples of that kind of thing. And of course, this is where Deepak as, as a medical doctor is, is, is quite, quite expert, but absolutely. Um, there yeah. are, are cases of, of that. There's also cases of anosognosia, where you can um, deny that you have a paralysis in the left side of your body uh, and then come out of it. So it's almost like there's a person that inside of you that knows you're paralyzed, uh, uh, but there's another person that can't deal with it and doesn't know that you're paralyzed. So you, it's very, very interesting, the notion of self. Yeah, and so Deepak, I would love to know your thoughts. It was funny, I was recently reading your book, uh, Super Brain, and in it, you get into the concepts of the brain versus the mind and how if we allow it to, the brain controls us. However, if we connect to the mind or what we could theoretically from Eastern principles call consciousness, then we can begin to tap into the true potential of our brain. How do you perceive what an identity is and is it something that can evolve? First, I want to respond to Don and many things he said, and to your question also about multiple personalities can have uh, multiple different diseases, allergies in one, diabetes in one, not the other, which is very perplexing. I've even read that uh, there's a change of color uh, in the eyes when uh, in multiple personalities, when they switch uh, from one to the other. Leave that aside. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to now actually talk about, comment on what Don said. See, we are in a very interesting conversation right now um, because Don has his foot in two camps right now. He has his foot in the scientific camp, which at the moment is based on an ontology that assumes that physical reality is real. That you know, But at the same time, Don has written a book called the case against reality. So, you know, and yet right now he's using physicalist arguments mm. to answer the question that you asked. And they have a deep insight. These physical arguments have a deep insight into where we, I think we are going with this question of identity. Because I understand totally what Don is saying, but also I have my own practice. And I'll tell you what I've learned from practice, also what uh, the great wisdom traditions say about identity which is very important. So um, everything that Don has said in the spiritual traditions of non-duality, which include uh, Kashmiri Shaivism, Vedanta, aspects of Buddhism, they're all non-dual. So there's no, in reality, there's no difference between mind, brain, body, universe, and consciousness. There's no difference. They're all different modes of consciousness knowing itself. I'll repeat that. They're all different modes of consciousness knowing itself. So consciousness knows itself symbolically as the mind. It knows itself symbolically as the brain. It knows itself symbolically as the body and the world. And incidentally, only in humans, because <laughs> humans ask these questions 
Um, there's no other species that ask these questions. So these are human constructs and we are dealing with human questions, not with the question that a caterpillar would ask or a dolphin or, or any other living being. And yet those beings have consciousness too. So this brings us to the definition of consciousness in the wisdom traditions. And there are many. Okay, so one definition is consci of consciousness is consciousness is the fundamental ground of awareness in which experience happens. Experience happens. That's one definition. Consciousness by itself is not the contents of consciousness. It is the container of the contents of consciousness, which are actually modified forms of consciousness as sensations, images, feelings, thoughts, perceptions. So consciousness is also the knowing element in every experience. You can't have any experience without consciousness, including the one we're having, okay? So it is the knowing element in every experience. It is the fundamental awareness in which experience happens. It is the potential for experience. It is also the contents of experience, which are the modified expressions of consciousness. So in these traditions, we divide reality, and now I'm taking a little digression into symbolic and non-symbolic, okay? Symbolic reality is everything that Don is speaking about. It's symbolic reality. Um, and in this symbolic reality, we use the rules of mathematics, we use the rule of quantum mechanics, we use the rules of regular science, theories, observations, experiments, validation, falsification, etc. Of course, science gets more and more sophisticated, so we discard Newtonian science for relativity, and then we have problems uh, kind of reconciling that with quantum mechanics, not with standing all the, all the problems that the scientific method has um, trying to explain reality. Mm. There are problems, including, you know, what is, is there a cause for the Big Bang? What happened in the Planck Epoch? Why is the universe so fine-tuned for mind and life and our own consciousness with mathematical precision? Why was cosmic inflation so precise that it, it was off by a little decimal? We won't be having this conversation. Why is the, um, uh, the cosmological constant off by a power of one, by you know, magnitude of one to the power of 120? Lots of problems. All of this new science is based on approximations, and yet they work. I mean, we are using technology right now to have this conversation. We're using technology every time I pick up my smartphone. So what the heck is going on? Okay. Right. And I think if we take what we've learned from science and what we learned from the wisdom traditions, that all of this that we're doing would be impossible without consciousness. The scientific method would be impossible without consciousness. Mathematics is a human experience in consciousness. So experiments are designed in consciousness. Theories are conceived in consciousness. Observations are made in consciousness. So we can't get rid of consciousness no matter what we do and how we approach the question of identity. Now, given this I question of identity, in my spiritual practice, the first question, even before starting meditation, is who am I? Mm. I is the operating word. The second question is, what is it that wants to know the answer to this question? Who am I? Okay. <laughs> I mean, do my neural networks seek an answer to the question, who am I? Is my genetic um, information in, the, in my uh, entangled microbiome, which includes uh, other species, is that asking the question? What is asking the question? And you go deeper and deeper and deeper with this question. So when I go deeper in this question, as have millions of others before me in these spiritual practices, one of the things I do is at night, I look at myself as a toddler going to school. I recognize that little guy, but it's not me, okay? That's an image now, a memory that's coming of somebody that was called Deepak. 
when he was seven years old. I mean, I can go back maybe six years, but not beyond that or earlier. You know, I don't remember how I learned to walk, but I did. I don't remember how I learned to um, speak, but I did. I'm speaking right now. I don't remember my A, B, C, D. Okay, I don't remember one, two, three, four. I don't remember my life as an embryo. I don't remember my life as an infant. All of those were my identities at one time, right? A different body, different mind, different personality, hopefully, personality grows, right? Uh, there's nothing about this brain, this body, that was there when I was born. You know, two days ago, my kids were at home and they said, you know, Dad, do you use the pool? I said, no. So why don't you use the pool? I said, I haven't swum for 25 years. I said, come on, get into the pool. So I get into the pool, I start swimming. The brain that learned how to swim 20 years ago, there's, it doesn't exist anymore. This brain, which didn't exist then, remembers how to swim. There is mystery upon mystery upon mystery when you ask the question, who am I? I cannot relate to this kid. I cannot relate to the teenager nervously biting his nails when he saw a pretty girl. I cannot relate to the young ambitious doctor in the emergency room who was actually bloodthirsty for wounds so he could uh, refine his surgical skills. I can't relate to those, all those characters. So what is my identity? And I still say, I, I. So this is a very difficult problem that you have asked. Here's what the wisdom tradition say. It says every identity you assume is a provisional identity. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, it's changing at the speed of light. Why? Because qualia, which are the basis of experience, actually move at that speed. I tell you to think of your mother, think of the Empire State Building. You move from one location to another location without going through the space in between. How did you do that? I uh, tell you to think of a rainbow, immediately see an image. If I close my eyes, I see nothing other than blackness. Open my eyes and the blackness is this three-dimensional theater of space-time and causality. But in fact, its real nature is it is black. Electromagnetic radiation has no color. Hmm. Electromagnetic radiation has no form. So when I close my eyes, I'm seeing reality. When I open my eyes, I'm not seeing reality. Okay. I'm constructing reality, as has been said so many times. Okay, so many times. So who am I is every identity I seek is provisional. It's not real. Okay, number one. Number two, my identity is entangled with your identity because I exist only in relationship. Hmm. As, as a physical, psychological, emotional being, I exist only in relationship. Not only is my identity entangled with yours, it's entangled with the trees and the sky and the sun and the stars and the insects and the bees and the ecosystem of existence, the entangled microbiome, which in this scheme would be the symbolic representation of entangled sentient beings expressing their consciousness as this universe. In fact, multiverses, all species specific and in humans, even culture and mathematics specific. We create everything that we experience. But we are not our creation. We are the source in which this is happening. And now finally, is there such a thing as an individual? That's the basic hallucination. What we call the individual is actually a differentiated consciousness from a single source. And differentiation is not separation. You know, like when, when a single cell, a pluripotential cell, a fertilized ovum, divides 50 times to make a human body. Okay, 50 times when you have a human body, trillions of cells, one becomes two, becomes four, exponentially, suddenly 50 trillion cells, more than all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Each cell is a differentiated cell. The eye is differentiated. The brain is another differentiation. 
the hair is another, the fingernails another, the nose another, the liver, they're not separate, they're differentiated. Okay, that's why they work together, entangled. You know, the stomach doesn't say, why should I digest food with, for the brain? What's it doing for me? The liver doesn't say, why should I remove toxins from this body? What's it doing for me? It's one activity and it's a differentiated, entangled activity. There's no separation. Differentiation is not separation. So in the Buddhist philosophy, the word is, we are inter-beings that inter-arise in the inter-isness. There is only the inter-isness. And what is the inter-isness? It is the entanglement of conscious agents in Don's words. That is the only reality. And we are differentiated from that, not separate from that. Okay. Furthermore, what we call existence, because it is not in space-time, it's spaceless, timeless, inconceivable, infinite, formless, fundamental reality. Since it's not in space and time, it's timeless by definition. It's immortal or, or, um, or timeless is a better word because immortal suggests duration and time, which itself, according to Dawn, is an artifact. Okay, so it's timeless existence, number one, which means birth and death are constructs based on false identity. Okay, there's no such thing. Okay. <laughs> because the construct itself is based on a false identity. Existence is timeless. Also, existence is invincible. You know, this morning I was looking up how long have spiders been around? Okay, millions of years. But they've been around almost as long as insects have been around. And insects have been around as long as the same time as plants have been around. They all came together. Okay, so while we give lip service to mechanistic Darwinian, I do, Darwinian evolution, I actually believe that evolution is the creative play of consciousness. It's the creative play of consciousness. It's qualia shuffling and reshuffling for maximum diversity of experience. And that's what we're here for, for maximum diversity of experience. We squeeze it by identifying ourselves into the volume of a body and the span of a lifetime, which is a total illusion. So that's, I think it corresponds to what Don is saying. So I'm hearing you both say something similar coming from two different angles. And one thing I would love to know, Deepak, and I'm sure this is probably weighing on your mind and our viewers' minds as well, is why do we have the experience of being separate? To your point, we have all these intertangled qualia. We all come from the same. We're differentiated, but we're these interbeings rather than different beings. So why do we have suffering? Why do we have people who are impoverished and other people who have not? And my question to you, Don, is, is there an evolutionary advantage that we don't see where our brains tricked us into thinking it was better to see ourselves as separate and if so, is there a way to repair that so as a society we can evolve and heal if we are, as Deepak says, all interbeings? Well, I would first love to hear Deepak's response to why do we have this illusion of separateness from, from his framework. I'm very interested in that. I, 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 according to what I know um, and according to the traditions that I come from, why is an un un unanswerable question? <laughs> Because even explanation is a human construct. Mm. Okay, explanation is a human construct. Who invented that idea? Who says you need an explanation for existence? Who says you need an explanation for awareness of existence? In fact, the Vedanta says there is no explanation for existence or awareness of existence, but you can make it up. And if you make it up, it becomes true for you. So what they do is, they say it's the creative play of consciousness for maximum diversity. You can't have joy without suffering. You can't have up without down. You can't have hot without cold. You can't have pleasure without pain. All experiences by contrast. And that's what creates this creative experience. And as long as you don't take it personally, because you're not a person anyway, you can enjoy this experience. You can upgrade the illusion. You can downgrade the illusion. You can get rid of the illusion. In fact, in every perceptual act, I look here, I look there, that's a snapshot of perception. 
that's a snapshot of perception. In between is the formless. You can't have experience of form and phenomena without the formless. So the formless is the only reality. In fact, Vedanta says, if you can see it, touch it, taste it, smell it, conceptualize it, imagine it, name it, it's not real. The only thing that's real is that which you can't name or conceptualize or imagine or see or perceive or even think about. That is the only reality. Now okay. that's going all the way, okay? But bottom line is we can, while we are all here, you, me, Don, everybody, we are fictional characters in a collective dreamscape. The goal of existence is to wake up from that so we can either upgrade the illusion or downgrade the illusion, all the while doing that we are the choreographer, the director, the producer, the hero, and the village of the whole show. We're the snake eating its own tail right now. <laughs> Don, I turn it over back to you. I, I think that, I hear what you're saying, Deepak. I think that's really true, is that we are the creators. We're, we don't even realize we wake up every day and we're saying how our movie is going to go. We're in this big proverbial okay. movie. Before Don answers, you ask the question, why, why is there suffering? So yes. this is the answer from the Vedanta. They say five causes of suffering. But they're very precise, by the way, through experiential knowledge, not scientific knowledge, experience. The first is not knowing reality. First cause, it's called the first klesha, the case against reality, Don's. Number one principle is the first cause of suffering. You're confusing reality with a symbolic representation of reality. Mm. First cause of suffering. Second cause of suffering, grasping and clinging to experience which is ephemeral and evanescent. As soon as we finish this Zoom call, that experience is over. It's gone forever. You can't grasp it. So second cause is grasping at experience which is evanescent, transient, ephemeral, uncatchable. Third is recoiling from the same thing, being afraid <laughs> of the same thing. Fourth is identifying with a skin encapsulated ego, which is a socially induced hallucination. And the fifth is the fear of death. Okay, these are the five causes of suffering in the non-dual traditions. And the solution is one. One, the case against reality. <laughs> Fascinating. Very fascinating. Thank you, Deepak. That's really, really interesting. It, the, what you're saying really corresponds precisely with the mathematical models that my colleagues and I are, are developing, in which, as you say, there's just a field of awareness in which experiences arise. And that's what our mathematics actually says. We use probability spaces, and what they are are these spaces that that are just potentials until you actually have a particular experience that happens. And so, so you can think of the probability space as a mathematical model of the idea of an awareness without content. And then the particular experiences that you have are the events that happen within that probability space. So the, the mathematics there aligns with what you're saying. And in our fundamental theory of conscious agents and its dynamics, there are no separate selves. They're, they're, the notion of a self is actually not part of the fundamental mathematical apparatus that we have. Mm -hmm. Selves are constructs that systems of conscious agents um, can, can make. Um, and they're, they're just made on the fly and they can dissolve, but they're not, they're not fundamental aspects of the mathematics at all. They're just among the various symbols that we make. And so the, now the, so everything seems to uh, align up with what, what you're saying. Now, as a scientist, it's very interesting that, you know, you, you say that asking the question of why um, is, so as a scientist, right, I'm, I'm trained to ask why all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, when we do that, you know, when Einstein asked why, you know, he, he came up with stuff, right? When scientists ask why they come up with interesting things and it does change our reality as you said we get our technology so there is some payoff there is some payoff for asking why um and then asking why with asking for rigorous answers to the question why right so einstein 
like when, when Einstein was trying to understand gravity, he had this brilliant idea. If I was in an elevator and the elevator was just free falling and I had a, an apparatus to weigh myself in the ele elevator, I would find that I was weightless. So if I'm in a free falling elevator, I would weigh nothing in the elevator. And you can actually do the experiment, they've done it, and, and it's true. When you're free falling, you weigh nothing in, inside the elevator. It took him eight years of hard work to turn that really interesting intuition into the mathematics. So he turned it into mathematics, but it, you know, it took even a brilliant guy like Einstein eight years of hard, hard work to do that. And when he finally wrote down the equation of general relativity, that was really cashing out the meaning of if I'm in an ele elevator and it's free falling, it, I'll be weightless. One thing that that mathematics entailed that Einstein didn't understand, but it was discovered by a guy named Schwarzschild a year later, is that there are things called black holes. Mm. Now Einstein was appalled. He, he, he thought that was terrible. He didn't like it. And for decades, he disbelieved it. So, so what's interesting here, and it, it, it's, it's fun to pursue this in terms of asking what is awareness and what, what is this game of consciousness and so forth. Because in Einstein's case, here's this genius. He had this really deep insight. He turned it into math and realized that his insight had all sorts of consequences that he didn't like, uh, that he didn't want. But it turned out we find black holes. And without black holes, our galaxy wouldn't exist. And, and we probably wouldn't be here either. And so so there, the, the question of asking why. So as a scientist, this is an interesting point for me, right? Um, because we're after asking questions why and coming up with explanations. But I agree. I agree that no scientific theory can explain everything. Every scientific theory starts with miracles, right? We call them our assumptions, the, the foundational assumptions of our theory. But that's where our theory stops. And the explanation only starts from those miracles. And so you're absolutely right that science, no matter how deep we dig, we will always face a miracle, no matter what theory we have. And that, that means that there is the interesting thing about science. So on the one hand, it's turned out to be an extremely profitable enterprise. Right? We're talking right now because of what science has discovered. On the other hand, we know as scientists, that it will always have this incredibly fundamental limit that we can never get around. There will always be a miracle at the very, very start of any scientific theory. So, so yes, I'm, I'm on, uh, on the same page. As a scientist, though, I must say the itch to ask why questions doesn't go away. <laughs> and uh, there, there are questions, for example, like, um, why is it that I can experience what I call my experiences, my headache, my taste of chocolate, but I can't experience your experiences. There does seem, right, to be this inability. So even if you have known someone for many, many years and you can empathize, you, your wife, your husband, you, uh, you, a, a child that, that you've known and raised, so you know them very, very well. And yet there's this feeling that my experience, my headache, or my, my wife or my husband can empathize with that, with that headache, but they can't have my headache. They can have their headache, but I can't have mine. So I'd be interested in, in uh, what you and Jennifer think about that. I have, I have two responses uh, on the headache uh, question, because you actually hinted at them. When you have extreme empathy uh, with mm. someone, like you, when you, let's say your child is injured and, and slapped and you wince, right? Yeah. You, for that moment, your neural networks and that child's neural networks are, I would say, entangled. At that moment, they're entangled because you're having the same uh, 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 sensory ex experience almost. Now, of course, in the non-local traditions in yoga, there's a whole chapter in Patanjali on uh, the Yoga Sutra Patanjali called Siddhis and Riddhis where when you get rid of your local identity, you have access to other people's experiences. Mm. You know, when you transcend your local identity, you have access to non-local experiences because actually all experience is non-local anyway. You know, we think it's local because we think it's happening in the head, 
but the head is happening in the non-local too. The neural network is also an experience in the non-local. So ultimately, entanglement without personal separate identity can actually give you access to other people's experience, even the experiences of other species. So and there are meditations in this, these traditions on how to have snake consciousness, or how to have butterfly consciousness, or how to have tree consciousness, because they all have some aspect of consciousness. But one thing that I think we could conclude on this, because what this idea of explanation and what Don said, that we can't stop wanting to explanation, uh -huh. I think there's some truth in every mythology in every mythology. And the mythology that I was thinking of right now is the Garden of Eden. Okay, suddenly there's a tree that says there's the knowledge of good and evil there. And you know, God says to humans, don't, don't eat of that tree of knowledge <laughs> of good and evil. But of course, humans are as godlike as they can be. I mean, no other species would say, I want to know the secret of the knowledge of good and evil. No other species. I can't imagine even a primate doing that, only a human. So the humans did that and they came up with the idea of explanation. Okay, as soon as they ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is separation basically, it's the fall from grace. It's not understanding separation and differentiation, the distinction that created the need for explanation. We became godlike, and we are right now through this technology. Okay, we have created, I mean, we have created everything. We now have thinking of creating quantum computers, which means you, the speed of light is not a limitation anymore. Okay, you can actually beam Scotty up from here to whatever uh, another galaxy at, theoretically, right? So we have created the knowledge, which is godlike. We take constructs, we embed ourselves in them, and we create this thing that we call the universe. So whilst I say there may be no explanation for anything, we are the only species that can come up with explanations. And they work. That's the bizarre thing, that even our incomplete explanations with approximations at best they work. So I would say it's a great mystery. And, uh, and the work of the scientist and the mystic is both explore the mystery, live the mystery, and never give up asking why, even though there may not be an answer. Right. Yeah, I think, gentlemen, that we could do an entire episode on the observer principle, because everything we've been discussing since episode one is that we are having this conversation. Don is finding his mathematics you are finding what you're looking for based on Eastern traditions, Deepak, because you're looking there. <laughs> and until we can fully understand and begin to grasp that idea that what is in front of us is there because we're looking for it. And that gives rise to bigger inquiries about what has us see reality. And if all of this does become made manifest through our consciousness, I would love to do an entire episode if you are both game on how we can begin to repaint reality or paint reality for whatever we want. Let us be the Mozart, let us be the Picasso of our life. And how from a scientific and spiritual standpoint, can we intersect these ideas to put the paintbrush back in our hands so that we can begin to harness the godlike powers that we have to create this reality that isn't even happening. <laughs> Well, let's do it. I mean, we, we should address reality, physical, non-physical, wave, particle. Is it wave, particle? What is it before it's a wave? What is it before it's a particle? All of that. This is actually Don's uh, domain as well. But for today, I think, if you don't mind, I'd like to suggest the title, The Case Against Reality and the Causes of Suffering, and mm -hmm. have the book uh, right at the top and mine below that the case against reality and the causes of suffering. We're not saying that we have a solution. We just say there's a connection. Definitely. That not? I Sounds couldn't... great to me. Okay. The Perfect. case against reality causes, and next time go deeper into exactly what you said.
This is this is lovely. I'm really enjoying. Yeah, no, the... We are unraveling some good mysteries for ourselves, <laughs> anyway. That's right. This is. I mean, I'm I'm learning, and that's that's what's in it for me. I'm really learning here. This is. So great. am I. So am I. And I'd yeah. love at one point, guys, if you're ever open to it, to discuss where the universe came from, from a spiritual versus scientific Big Bang. Yeah, yeah we can discuss stuff. the Big Bang, or we can discuss the universe happening right now. Yeah, Both. that's true. <laughs> well, Brilliant. we could go on for hours, guys. So thank okay. you so much don't, again for joining. Don't edit any of this conversation. People enjoy these informal remarks from Perfect. the feedback I'm getting. We will leave it exactly okay. as it is. So thank you guys again for another engaging and dynamic thank chat. Thank you, Don. Really thank you very much. It was a lot of fun. See Jennifer. you soon. Thank okay, you. Okay, guys. Bye, Don. Bye, Bye Deepak. Bye. Great to see you Bye. both.